welcome to this good evening good afternoon welcome to the data visualization session this is a master class by uh, faculty of the university college of dublin under the guidance of professor eleni mangina who you heard on the very first day on 28 jan so before we begin we are still waiting for a few people to join in so i hope all of you have got the study materials because that will form the basis of this master class and uh, don't worry about you know if you understood it or not because that's the purpose of this master class liliana will be taking us through it um the idea is first have you got it because um, that's the most important thing if you haven't let us know and uh, we'll try and uh, send you the links but it's on discord if you have missed it and how is everyone feeling can you put in the chat section uh, you know a word or two about how you're feeling or give us a reaction so that we uh, we can see how you're doing Hey, great, Eleni. Lovely to see you, and uh, we are looking forward to this session. Okay, Pratik says grand. I'm glad. A lot of positive energy. Cool. So, um, hope all of you have connected with your teams, um, and um, you know you've had at least one interaction with them. Uh, I hope your team charter is in place because that becomes a guiding document. Everything's going to move very quickly, and so you know it's really good if you have an understanding between y'all. There are people from India and Ireland in every team, and we are working virtually, so it's great to have these ground rules in place so that we have a great working relationship. We want this to be fun as well. So uh, as soon as you can complete it, the better, and. Um, as as mentioned earlier we are really looking forward to uh, seeing your outputs at the end of this uh, three week challenge uh, but no stress we are going to walk with you through this uh, through the three weeks and this master class is really uh, you know going to be helpful uh, we also have the next master class on the 11th so you have a full week between the two uh, and next week i promise you is going to be even more interesting uh, we are going to have a couple of people talking about empathetic tech but also about compelling visualization so from a community standpoint so i hope you come for that too and those who miss it also encourage them to come for it so now without further ado i'm going to um you know hand it over to liliana from professor eleni's team and um uh, once again welcome to everybody who's joining in and uh, put in the chat section how you're feeling or give us a reaction but um, if you haven't got access to the study materials do let one of us know and we'll uh, point you in the right direction so over to you liliana hi everyone uh, this is liliana pasquale i am a, a assistant professor at uh, the school of computer science in university college dublin I'm really excited to participate in this event and to interact with you. So I, I'm really looking forward to uh, interactions and nice chats. And I'll pass to Susan now. Thank you, Liliana. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to um, be a participate today. And uh, yeah, thank you for the opportunity uh, and the invitation. Um, so th the plan for today is that I'm going to um, give a talk and as will Liliana on our, our own works and projects we were involved in as kind of examples of how data analytics can help advance the, you know, gender equality and social justice and um, some kind of uh, inspiration, I guess, um, for how data analytics can help in this area. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll begin with, with my section. It's just a, a short talk. And then Liliana is going to give her talk about her work. Um, and then I'll, and then we'll, we'll get into the, the master class. OK, so can I just uh, share my screen? OK, 
Okay, so hopefully you can you can all um, see. Okay, so I'm going to talk in the context of you know uh, data analytics and also artificial intelligence. Um, so, so presumably this is this is something that like we all know how pervasive AI is um, at the moment. And if you're like any questions as I'm talking, please I have the chat in front of me. I'm very um, happy to um to take questions um and Liliana if anything comes up I haven't noticed feel free to interrupt me and uh, you know it would be nice if this was interactive as well um so if we think of artificial intelligence we know it's really pervasive it's in it's in it's writing news articles for us it's in you know predictive policing it's been used it's used for immigration you know for the facial recognition um for passport checks, but probably most influentially, it's in apps. It's in a lot of apps on people's phones, um, and I say most influentially because it's curating content. And we can we know that you know some of the trends aren't particularly advanced stages to women. You know, so um, so so an important part of data analytics is looking at the kind of data that's fed and these the filter bubbles and the recommender systems and and how this um relates to um to women so there's been a lot of cases you probably have been aw are aware of um already um in the media like a, a facial recognition how it's biased in terms of race and gender um how you know recommender systems that recommend jobs to men and women are they recommend different jobs and recommend lower paid jobs to women than men um predictive policing systems have been shown to um uh you, you know pre predict make predictions that just perpetuate past historical social injustices um and GPT-3 language generation algorithms are, are particularly problematic. So I, I, I don't know how many of you, maybe a thumbs up, have you heard of GPT-3, OpenAI's GPT-3? It generates language. Um, anybody heard of it? Good. No? Okay. So GPT-3 is one of the biggest language models. So it takes data to relate this to, yes, Adam, great, thank you. Um, it takes a load of data from the internet, makes a big language model, and then you know it can do different things like answer questions, but also if you give it a sentence, it will finish the story for you or something. So I've played around it with, in, in advance of this session just last night. So one example, and this is the most powerful language generation model in the world, some people say, you know. Um, I put in one sentence, and this relates to, you know, the topic of this violence against women. So she walked down a long, dark road alone. Okay, I put in that sentence as, and I said, okay, AI, language generator, finish my story. And what did it say? It said she had no idea where she was going. She just knew she had to keep moving. She had to get away from him. She had He had been abusing her for years. She was tired of being a victim. She was tired of being scared. She was tired of being alone. So, and on and on and on. Okay, so that was the first story that AI came up with on that uh, um, simple sentence. Another one, I changed the gender. I said, he walked alone walked a, a long dark road alone okay what did it say he had a heart full of pain he had a soul full of scars but he never stopped moving forward he never stopped fighting he never stopped dreaming he never stopped believing very very different okay so you can see how if you take data from the internet and train these powerful systems all the bias and all the stuff that we all know is on the internet comes out okay so how does data analytics address this how do we solve this kind of thing one of the problems of course is the the one of the ways we solve it is getting more women into data analytics into ai that helps address many of these issues there's real blind spots when you have a lack of diversity and that's that slide will show you the black lines are the men in machine learning you know on in the top um this was a snapshot in 2018 in the top journals 
okay? And the women were the purple. So we need more women in AI and data analytics. But there's, there's interventions at each stage. You know, you can, you can change the machine learning models itself. You can look at how you're sampling your data. You can uh, look at the data itself. And that's the focus for data analytics, I guess. And there's a lot going on world, you know, globally in the EU and the UNESCO most recently, G20. There's a lot of new regulations to tackle this kind of issue. So I want to look, focus on the data side, how we incorporate values of like social justice, gender equality, the kind of reasons we're here at this workshop, you know, how do we incorporate those high level principles into something that we can code and to be able to check the data? Um, because it, it's a very, we all know we want biased data, we want balanced data, but how do we check for it? Um, how, how do we make that happen? Uh, there is no, there's no one answer. This is just a few ideas. Um, what things do you want to look at? Again, these are the high level principles. You want to look at who wrote the data, but the perspectives, who wrote the data, who, whose perspective does it reflect? Um, you want to know like, whatever is in this data is going to create, have an influence on the world. So it, it, it's going to change the world, the world. It's going to create concepts. So if you're taking data from the internet, which is a lot of content about violence against women, like say it's Google News, you know, and the, or that itself, if you embed that in a system, has the potential to create concepts in the world. Um, you're looking at the theory in the data, what worldview, and also try to include subjugated and new forms of knowledge. We, you know, there's authoritative sources that we use again and again, but actually that leaves out knowledge that comes in different forms from a lot of people who don't have access to, um, uh, you know, to, to, to the, the forms of knowledge we all use, you know, the established forms, okay? So that's all very high level. What would you actually, if you were there, you've got Python, you've got um, some of the tools we look at in the, um, in the masterclass, and you have a load of text. I'm going to focus on the text bit. What would you look at? Volumes of mention. How many times are women mentioned in your core, in the text at all? Because if it's very little, that means, you know, there's, it's evidence of some bias. Another thing is describing grown women as girls. Is that happening in the text? Are there gender specific terms like family man, career woman, you know, woman doctor, or those kind of terms that indicate a, a, a bias. Um, and also androcentric terms like, you know, mankind or using man for, to mean both men and women. Um, ordering, how do we name uh, uh, men and women when, when we're listing them? Okay, because that again indicates, uh, it can indicate, we tend to name the most powerful first. So like, king or king and queen you know doctor and nurse so that we we name the most powerful first so if we're if you have a text and men are always listed first that indicates that that concept it's it's uh, um, Im embedded there assigns more power to men um are there negative or stereotypical associations so you'd look at the adjectives the kind of verbs used what what verbs are used and what what's what kind of verbs and what adjectives are used and um, one example um, is we um, looked at 35,000 texts from the British Library okay weighed one file from that called a word to vec model and that encodes how closely related different words are to each other and what do we find now this is texts from the 1800s in Britain. So everything you're gonna expect from the 1800s in Britain, we found, you know, um, a very, you can do this. If you have a lot of text, you could do this with two lines of Python, you know, making this file and then querying them, you know, a few lines of Python. It's, it's now not complicated really. Um, 
So, for example, we found that nouns associated with women were lover, minx, spinster, vixen, very, you know, very, very much terms related to, uh, you know, uh, very sexual terms are, you know, their identity, whether they're married or not, you know, and man, it was a different type of stereotype, scamp, scoundrel, rascal. And what kind of adjectives for women? It was innocent, lovable, feminine, girlish, foolish, flighty, um, childish. Um, you know, and for men, it was much more neutral adjectives. Okay, so those kind of patterns we can assess and, uh, and uh, analyze. Okay. Um, another one is action words. Kind of, if you look at the words, the donate action, is there, a, is there a gendered pattern there? You know, for, you know, literature from 1800s in Britain, there was, you know, but if you do it on a modern corpus, is, does that uh, still happen? Okay, so th those are the, the kind of things you can, can look for. Um, so if you're trading, trading a big model um, and you want to know, is there bias are women, these are stereotypical representations of women. Those are the kind of things you can look for in your data. Um, and Annie, yeah, it would be nice to see if there are pastoral differences in the adjectives between cultures, for sure. And this particular, uh, um, uh, I don't have the slide here, but this particular one used the word embedding model to look at the representation of migrants um, in the 1800s in, in Britain. So, and it looked, there was a lot of Irish migrants and Jewish migrants into Britain um, and found very interesting cultural differences um, in how they were portrayed. Um, so just to call out, you know, one, if you're not aware of this NGO already, Data 2X, they look at, um, again, a lot of the issue is, the data that's there there can be biased, and this is fed into AI, and and also there's a lack of data. So you know you can't train a model on something on data that just you know if the, if the data isn't there. Okay, so you need balanced and represented, you know, balanced and non-stereotypical. Um, representations of women for these AI models as well. But Data 2X calls out the gaps. And for one, for example, they thought, well, they took one country and said, there's a lot in the news. And that's a problem with AI uses Google News, a lot of, uh, because they produce text, so much text. But a lot of that is about um, women being victims of violence in the news. So they, to address this, they looked at how they could document, um, uh, how women, you know, women's unpaid labor and how that could be documented and, dis and, and described and put out there. So invisible no more, because if it's not written down, it doesn't exist. And that is so true in the world of AI algorithms, whatever is there, and especially because it's taken from the internet and perpetuated through these systems, if it's uh, whatever there is going to be perpetuated. Um, so yeah, so that is my talk. Very brief talk, just some inspiration and to, as to how you could um, use data analytics to address some grave um, problems with artificial intelligence um, that are causing some, some big problems with social injustice in the world. So um, over to you, Liliana, for your um, inspirational talk. Thank you, Susan. I, I, think, I think that was very interesting and very related to uh, the the data set that uh, the students will have to analyze for the hackathon. I'm not sure if there are any uh, any question. Um, oh, thanks, Tina. Yeah. So it, it will be nice to see if there are pattern differences in these adjectives between cultures. Mm. From Eleni. Yeah, I addressed that earlier on, saying there was, uh, we did look in this data set, um, and it was fascinating, the different, we looked at the representations of migrants in Britain at the time, and it was very interesting. Yeah, I just don't have that slide here. Okay, sorry, I, 
also there are, there are more questions. So Tessa, Tessa is a question. Yes, um, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I was just wondering, like, how can we um, imagine unbiased data even? Like, is, does it just, how, because we all have our own biases as well. So do we have to, can we, would we be, how, <laughs> how can I even phrase, like, how can we uh, trace the bias in the data if our own biases are still very present in that sense. So like, how can we imagine unbiased data? Is it, is it, is, yeah, I don't know how to imagine balanced data in that sense, if we, yeah. Yeah, I, yes. think that's um, I think that's a really, really important point. And um, my own, there's different, perspectives on this. So you, you can see some articles who have, you know, a formula for fairness, um, a mathematical equation, you know, um, and that has a role to play when it comes to things like, uh, especially computer vision and stuff. But um, my own my own perspective is that there's no such thing as unbiased data, because once, you know, we're human beings, we're subjects, and it can like no matter how much data you have, it's only a certain angle or snapshot. It's encoding a perspective, um, no matter what. So I think what you can do is ask questions, and I think training from social scientists, um, or you know, the social scientists have an important role because there's decades of work done in this. Like what is bias? So the few features I showed are kind of what um, feminist linguists have said are problematic features. Um, so th th there's ways, like there is that knowledge there, and I suppose, but we have a minimum. <laughs> we have something that we can all, most of us can agree on, in principles. Um, and then beyond that, we can ask questions of data um, and, and find out what ideology is embedded there, rather than saying, it's not a black or white thing. You know. Thank you. There is another question. You talk about AI collecting data. Could explain more on how these data collection are filtered to maybe propose a policy, for example, having paid labor? Um, Sima, I was talking in the more, more in the context of AI algorithms being trained on data. So like there's, there's two projects we're looking at at the moment. Is compute, one is computer vision and another is natural language processing, and they take as much data as they can to train models. Um, so in that sense, the AI algorithms aren't collecting the data, but they're training, they're being trained on data. Um, and kind of, yeah, so that's the context I meant in that. On that. I guess making sure the data are representative enough of different groups and don't use, unbiased, don't use biased language is probably the way to go to uh, re remove biases. I mean, I guess that, I guess that should start from the data that we create, the data set that we create. Who creates this data? Because if there are always Western countries that create this data, you know, other countries, for example, or there are always male who create these data sets. Of course, uh, uh, the perspective can be a biased, and and so if we uh, uh, make sure that every group is represented and langu the language also that is used in the data set um, is unbiased, then, then it's probably the, the machine learning algorithms can, can take less biased decisions. <laughs> would, that, that be, would that be the, this the way to go? Yeah, I, I think so. Absolutely. Yeah, totally agree. And the cultural diversity thing is, is, is an interesting one. So, one um, project we're looking at looks at um, the search results from depending on where you are in the world. OK, um, but but if if most of the Internet is like you said, Liliana, the content is Western focused, that, that has an effect. So do we want really localized results or do we? Yeah. So I think that, that 
and in a especially if we're taking like a load of data from the internet and most of it is generated from the from the west the western countries then the, the cultural diversity will um, not come through so it's certainly it's a, it's, a, it's an issue we're looking at at the moment i think adam raised his hand so adam would you like to ask a question yeah hi thank you so much for that talk it was um really really interesting and informative uh it, it made me think I, I put a comment in um it made me think of have you seen any examples of where ai systems have been used to help reduce bias in humans as in to um to combat stereotypes or to educate people or to make people more aware of their own internal biases I've, I've heard, well, not a first hand scene, but I've heard of it being used in recruiting, for example, to um, to address human biases. And in theory, you know, the idea being that if you have, if you give an AI algorithm enough objective data that it could, you know, um, eliminate a lot of the human subjectivity that's involved in interviewing and analyzing CVs. You know, I, I'm not aware of it being hugely successful. Eleni, you, you have your yeah, hand up. Uh, yeah, because I've, I've recently used a um, uh, gender uh, detector uh, in terms of uh, job descriptions, text. So what we're trying to do, for example, we were trying to find if certain job descriptions have more uh, are more male oriented so they're using terms that are towards male applicants maybe that's why this area has more male applicants in the recruitment and uh, so far it has been helpful so it it does bring input towards our own bias when we're writing the job descriptions which is very very helpful and uh, we're still working on it but i think Key point, and I did put it here, unbiased data is an oxymoron, right? Um, by default, but when you collect the data, if you're trying to collect as many data as possible, and then the awareness of the bias is the first step because we're all biased, but once you're aware of it, then you can take it out of the equation and, and look objectively in your data set, right? And, and it's really important and for data analysts as well instead and you will see it later on today with the exercises and you will see it when you're working on your data provided uh, for this data challenge is really important to take out your own bias of what you think is safe for women for example right I will have to run to a lab which we'll I'll leave it until last minute because this is so exciting here but I'll come back soon yeah Okay, thank you, then. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. 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 And on the one hand, it could be something probably benign as saying, look, have you considered X or have you considered Y? But that is a slippery slope. And how far do you go where the AI just starts to say, oh, you didn't consider X. And now the AI is starting to nudge you. And there are ethical problems with autonomy and agency. And do we want machines that start to present choices differently because they think that is more objective, right? And then, then you're down a completely different uh, social problem. And so I think we have to tread carefully when, when we talk about bias. I think the point that everyone's been making here, that there's no such thing as unbiased data. Us being aware that there is no such thing is probably the big first step. And then we can come up with tools to help us make better decisions. But I don't think we should leave it to the AI to say, oh, hey, you're being biased, do this instead. And that's problematic. Um, that's my opinion. Right? <clears throat> Thanks, Vivek. I think we're, we're 
By the way, I, I, I think we're done with the questions, sir. Are we on this? Do you yes. want to move on to your uh, section, I, Liliana? I just wanted to make sure there were no more questions. Yeah, I think we're, uh, we're all right. So, um, um, uh, thank you for attending. And uh, can you see my screen, by the way? So yeah, I, uh, I, I just wanted to um, give you a quick, quick introduction to my research interest. I am actually, I'm not a data uh, analytics expert, but I'm a software engineer and uh, I work on security, uh, data protection and digital forensics. So uh, I just wanted to raise another important topic. So when we collect data, when we analyze data, this data can refer to people who are vulnerable and examples uh, could be children. And so uh, how, what is done to protect data uh, collection of children? So uh, I just wanted to give you some insights. So children are more and more using uh, uh, social media uh, devices, sorry, so mobile devices to access social media contents. So uh, a statistics, you can see uh, links below, uh, demonstrated that by the age three or four children often access online content and supervised by an adult. And by the age of 15, about 89% of the children surveyed had a social media profile. That could be dangerous because uh, children sometimes lie about their age uh, to use apps that were originally designed for adults. And this can expose, the, expose them to threats such as uh, uh, online grooming, uh, cyberbullying, for example, or can expose them to content that they are not supposed to view. Uh, so this is an, a map that show you uh, the, what is the digital age of consent in different uh, countries in Europe. So uh, uh, nowadays there are many uh, data protection regulations that have been approved or proposed all over the world. For example, in India, there is the data protection bill that is going to be approved soon. Uh, but most of these uh, data protection rules uh, they establish a digital age of con consent. So what is the minimum age uh, or that the user must be before a, an organization can collect uh, uh, their data without parental consent? So this is what is established, the digital age of consent. In Europe, this varies from 13, for example, in Germany uh, or uh, uh, Sweden, uh, the, the, the age is 13, but then in other countries, for example, Ireland, the uh, digital age of consent uh, is higher. So uh, uh, I just wanted to give you an idea about uh, two main uh, data protection regulations that uh, one is in, uh, in US, so the Children's Online Protection Act, which is called COPPA. And they established that the minimum age uh, for collecting data about children without parental consent is 13. So this, this regulation uh, is, is uh, really good because they explicitly prescribed mechanism to be adopted to verify the age of children. For example, electronic scan, parental payment system, video or phone conference, government issued ID. However, because this is very time consuming for organization to implement this measure before collecting data, what happened is that in, in their term of, term of use, organization forbid uh, children to use their, uh, pre so um, uh, forbid children from using their own services. Uh, in Europe, there is another regulation called GDPR, which is the General Data Protection Regulation that established two main things. So one is to establish the concept of digital age of consent to, to, to be between 13 and 16. So if you are less than, uh, for example, 16, you need, depending on the country, you need verifiable parental consent for using service and to make sure that uh, uh, organization can process your data. Uh, and also uh, this regulation prescribed that uh, software companies needs to uh, enable data protection by design and by default. However, th this article, this article 23 is very general. So it's so general that in the end, um, organization really do uh, the bare minimum uh, to ensure that uh, children don't use their service. And what happened is that uh, big companies still collect data about underage users. So, uh, so one regulation COPPA is more specific about the measure to be used to verify the age of consent, while the other one, the GDPR, is, is less specific. 
So before I conclude, um, uh, I wanted to, to just showcase a study that we did, and we uh, analyzed the 10 most used social media apps uh, by children that were aged uh, 8 to 13. So I just provided the logos of the, this app. I think you are familiar with these logos. So uh, we analyzed Snapchat, Instagram, TikTok, Discord, House Party, and so on. And we try to answer two main questions. So the first question was how social media and communication app implement the age limits in their term of use and what mechanism they put in place to verify the age of their users. And so to answer the first question, uh, we, we analyzed the term of use of these uh, social media apps and we noticed that uh, uh, most of them do not specify the minimum age uh, that the user needs to be to use the app and uh, for, the for the organization to process their data without consent. The only uh, app that set the age limit to 16 is uh, WhatsApp to comply with the GDPR requirement. Actually, Skype even removed this age limit, allowing even underage children to use the app uh, under parental consent. And actually Discord, which is the app actually we use in this <laughs> uh, challenge, uh, does not state clearly what is the minimum age in the term of use at all. So uh, the, this analysis was done in 2020, by the way. So things might have changed over the last year. Uh, another, so the second answer with, with, with the second question we try to answer is what mechanism they put in place to verify the age of their users. And so we noticed that uh, uh, very, very few applications re even require the user to input their age during sign up. So when a user creates an account, uh, only um, uh, WhatsApp and Discord do not even, now Discord does, uh, but uh, up to 2020, Discord was not even asking the user to input a, a, a age during the sign up. Uh, the other things we, we found out is that uh, um, uh, uh, Skype allows under, as I was mentioning, allow under a user to create an account after receiving parental consent via email. However, even if a user state uh, their age uh, during sign up, uh, it's not clear how data for people who are between 13 and 16 uh, are collected because this could still be considered underage. And so how, which functionality is restricted, which data are protected. So the apps are not very clear about it. Um, uh, so, so there is lack of clarity absolutely about uh, which type of data for uh, these age categories are collected. Uh, finally, uh, the, the other surprising uh, findings is that uh, these apps don't really deter users from lying about their age. So uh, uh, the only app that do that are, for example, TikTok. So if you are trying to create an account with TikTok and you are declaring you are underage, uh, what happens is that you cannot create a, an account again using the same mobile device. But you have to, you can only, the only way you have to create an account in TikTok is to use a different device. Uh, for Messenger and House Party, uh, actually it was needed to uh, delete the account, the app, uninstall the app and clear the cache in order to uh, sign up again by uh, lying uh, about your age. And uh, um, for all the other app, uh, there was no type of verification, uh, age verification provided and ch ch children could circumvent uh, age verification mechanism by simply lying about their age. So, uh, you know, this is a big problem uh, because uh, still nowadays there is no really clear mechanism to protect children from using apps collecting their data. And, you know, we, we identified just a few uh, suggestions, a few advices. Uh, one for the app to clarify the minimum age of consent of um, uh, use a, a, a for use, use and treatment of the data in the terms of use. Uh, also, try to enable the most restrictive priva privacy setting if a user is at an age that is complies between 13 and 16, because uh, these are this can still be considered underage in certain countries, at least in Europe. So. Uh, a restricting privacy setting include, for example, sharing content only uh, with friends, for example, do not share the location of the children and so on. Um, 
encourage users not to lie about their age by providing mechanism to deter them from creating uh, accounts by lying on their age, about their age. And uh, finally, uh, implement robust, uh, robust age verification mechanism. Uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, one idea that we proposed was to uh, allow uh, parents to provide the date of birth of their children in the operating system of the mobile phone, such that this information could be taken directly by the apps from the mobile phone, instead of uh, being asked to the user creating an account. So um, there are other, other techniques such as adaptive authentication that could also be used in this scenario. But I'm, I'm just gonna stop here and uh, I'm just gonna check if you have any question about the topic. I have a question, Liliana. Can I ask a question? Um, so for WhatsApp, so does WhatsApp say you have to be 16 to use WhatsApp? In the terms of use, yes. You have to be 16. That's interesting because so many young teens or children are on WhatsApp. Yeah, because they don't, uh, so, so when you create an account, you can simply uh, put your age, but you know, no one verifies if you are lying about your age or not. Yeah. And in the end, they end up collecting a lot of data about children uh, under the justification that, you know, the, the, the real reason is that they don't really provide the strong age verification approaches. Okay. And, and, and this is very, and the problem is that, you know, uh, uh, underage uh, receive targeted uh, um, advertisement which is quite bad. Uh, on WhatsApp? And, okay. Well, yeah. not on WhatsApp, but on other apps. Yeah. Yeah, so, so uh, you know, they are exposed to content. They, they are not supposed to be. And, and organizations have ways to understand whether who is using the app is underage or not. But very few actually manage anomalies. So that they detect that their underage is using the app and try to ask for an additional authentication. This is what, for example, TikTok is doing. TikTok checks if the, uh, the person who's using the app is underage and provides way to uh, handle this anomaly and uh, ask them to provide proof of their age. Okay, so um, before we, uh, we move to the next topic, I just would like to introduce Vivek, Vivek Nalur. Vivek, do you want to say something about yourself? Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, hi, uh, hi everyone, my name is Vivek. Um, I'm, I'm a lecturer in UCD as well, and I'm uh, uh, in the same school as Liliana. I work... Um, in the area of machine ethics and multi-agent systems. Uh, so I suppose my comment from earlier about um, getting the AI to modify your behavior comes from my research interest, uh, which was on, uh, can we use AI to nudge people to behave more ethically? So, and when we um, talked to philosophers, we find that that is a bad idea. Uh, but anyway, so that's my, my research interests are in the area of getting computers to interact um, with human beings and can they detect if something ethically wrong is happening? So uh, I will start with the masterclass on data analytics and the Vivek will take over from where uh, up to a certain time around just before one, Vivek, Vivek will take over. Uh, so I guess everyone received the material that we shared the material is very comprehensive, so don't be uh, scared about the code that you find in the notebook. Uh, the, the, this masterclass uh, is not very long, so we won't be able to cover all the material that we share with you, but it's good that you keep that material for your uh, records because you can go through it uh, after this masterclass if you are uh, interested in exploring further topics uh, of data analytics and visualization. So. In this specific masterclass, we will cover the content of, of one of the file that you received in the, in the zip folder 
uh, that was shared with you. The title of this file is intro uh, .ipynb. Okay, so I'll start now sharing my screen. So first of all, I wanted to double check with you. Uh, if you, uh, if you receive the material, first of all, I'm gonna close this presentation. And so, so did, did you did you receive the material? Yes, I don't, I'm not sure. I don't see any message on the chat. Okay, so yes, let's... lots of yeses. Yes, so so you you will see that you receive a zip file with three files. So the file of interest is this one that you can see here. 001 underscore intro dot IPYNB. So this file ends with this extension, IPYNB. This extension means that these files are uh, files that can be visualized with an application that is called Jupyter Notebook. So Jupyter Notebook is really good because uh, it's, um, it provides an interactive development environment that combines different things, so allows you to write notes, to write code, and even to uh, run code interactively. So that's why this is very interesting. But the first thing, we need to try to open this file. One thing I, I, we were, you were asked to do before the, this masterclass was to install Notebook, uh, Jupyter uh, Notebook in your machine. And the, the first thing I want to ask you is, 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 it is whether you were able to do that. So I'm, I'm just going to check the chat. So do you have, uh, so, so maybe let's check how many of you have you, Jupyter Notebook installed. If you didn't do that, don't panic because you can do it very quickly. You can use uh, a, a, a browser extension uh, in, uh, to, to, to view the files. So the, someone raised, uh, I don't know who raised the hand. So what you can do, as I was mentioning on the, on the, um, in here, you can go on HTTPS Jupyter try and click on Jupyter Notebook. So if you go to this uh, link, so you don't need to install anything. So you, you just go on this link and then you select uh, uh, Jupyter Notebook. So you need to select uh, Jupyter Notebook. So for example, if I click on this link and we go down, you need to select Jupyter Notebook, okay? So once you select this Jupyter Notebook, you should be able to see something that looks like this. But I'm gonna just pause for one second and I'm just going to make sure that uh, each of you can, can, can see that what I see when you start Jupyter Notebook. And uh, just maybe we can check on the chats or if anyone has questions. This is so. So, if you don't have a, an environment um, uh, installed, so you don't. If you don't have Python or Jupyter uh, Notebook installed inside of your machine, you can still use this web application from uh, your web browser uh, that allow you to visualize Jupyter Notebook and to run code. So, I, I just I want to understand. Uh, how many can follow? If anyone is having issues, um, I could create a breakout room and work with them so you can keep moving forward. So yeah, um, yeah, that's, that's, yeah that's, that would be helpful, yeah. Yeah, just send me a DM, even if you don't want to let everyone know, we can make a breakout group, so. Okay, so to open your Jupyter file, you need to go to file and uh, uh, say open, click open, and oops, sorry. So uh, when you click open, actually, I'll uh, restart here. So 
when you have file and you click open, okay, so it seems that I need to restart <laughs> the notebook. Okay, so let me, let me, it seems there are issues. I'll try to reload everything again. <laughs> These things always happen when you, when you do things. Okay. Okay, perfect. So you should be able to see this page and then we do file open. So when I click on the open, uh, what we need to do is to basically click on this button called upload. When we click on the upload, we can upload the file from our machine. So you should be uh, pointing to the location where your file intro is placed. Click on intro.ipynb and open it. Okay, as simple as that. And then we, what we do, we upload it, we click on upload, and then we click on the file. So now you should see what I see. Okay, so basically this is a Jupyter notebook. It has some notes and introduction. And then if you can see here, we can, we can see snippet of Python code that we can run on the spot. Okay, that's the, why, the beauty of Jupyter. So why there is Python code in here? Because if we want to do data analytics, we want to visualize and manipulate data, actually Python offers a set of library that are quite concise to invoke uh, and to use uh, that are very handy uh, if you want to, for example, access data, modify data, and so on. So the first thing we are doing here uh, is to consider a data set that is called, uh, uh, that is curated by an organization called our world in data. We can also click here on the links that are provided uh, in, this, uh, um, uh, in, in this notebook. So uh, this data, uh, this, uh, this OID organization provides data, a data set about uh, COVID, but also about other uh, problems or, or topics. So uh, we will focus in this uh, specific uh, uh, masterclass on, data set, on a data set reporting COVID uh, incidence rate, number of deaths, number of people in ICU uh, per country in the world. So what is the objective of this masterclass? So we will learn how to uh, use uh, Jupyter. We will learn how to import uh, a, a data set, uh, how to manipulate uh, and access specific uh, fields uh, in our data sets, and how to handle, uh, handle missing data. And finally, if, if we have time, we will also uh, use uh, the matplotlib function to visualize uh, the data. So um, actually, Vivek, if you want to add anything while I'm talking, please feel free to do that. Uh, so, so. Uh, and I also wanted to thank Vivek and uh, Fatima Golpayeni, who also shared the material with us. So, so the first thing, so uh, now what we will do in this, in this uh, masterclass, we will go through the uh, Jupyter notebook, and we will have a look at uh, different snippets of code. So if we want to uh, do data analytics, the first thing is that we need to import the right libraries. So which are the right libraries we need to work with? So these libraries are, in this case, pandas, numpy, and matplotlib.pylab. So to import this library, we use uh, the, the, the notation import, the name of the library as and we provide an alias. So basically, every time we want to refer to a functionality of this library, it means that we will use the alias pd to refer to that library. And we do this for numpy, we refer to numpy as np, and to matplotlib.pylab as plt. So these are very good libraries because pandas, for example, um, uh, it provides a pattern library for data manipulation and analysis, and uh, uh, for numerical table and uh, time series. So Pandas is used to access data, to analyze the data, for example. NumPy 
uh, also add some mathematical function that we can use to modify our, our data. For example, Fourier function, it allows us to work with array and matrices. And Matplotlib, uh, uh, PyLab, uh, it, it's really the library that allows us to support data visualization, okay? To, to plot graphs that represent this, this data graphically, okay? So the first thing, so now we import the libraries that we uh, need. So the first thing we need to do uh, with the Jupyter Notebook, you see here you have a um, piece of code and we can run this piece of code dynamically by simply click, click, clicking on the button run here on top. So uh, in this case, this code won't do anything because it doesn't produce an output, but it allows to tell Jupyter Notebook, look, we need to load this library and to refer to this library using PD and P and PLT. Okay, so this is what this code does. And you know, if you have any questions, please uh, put them in the chat or raise your hand or feel free to interrupt me. So we will go through this file step by step. So once we imported these libraries, we need to uh, import our data sets. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the, the link, the GitHub link, where the data set uh, is provided. And we use this variable or with data set to uh, store this URL. And then uh, this data set is, is, is put uh, in, uh, in uh, a local file, which we, which we call local or with data set. Uh, and then uh, we use another file uh, to save our verified base data set. Okay. So as you can see here, our data set are expressed using the extension CSV. So command separate the values. So also the data set you will work it uh, with the, during the hackathon is a CSV file. What is a CSV? I know some of you are not familiar with CSV files. So what is a CSV file? I'm just gonna um, uh, show you uh, a, if I can, just one second. Uh, numbers. So this is how a, can you see my screen, right? Can you see the CSV file? Hello? Yes. Yes, okay. So this is an example of CSV file. So basically you have values separated by commas and this is a way to, to visualize it. So basically each value, this is the country ISO code of the country the continent, the location, each of these values will be separated by a command. The numbers is, a, is an application that allows you to visualize uh, this data in the form of a table. But uh, for each uh, uh, field, so we have total cases, new cases, uh, total deaths, new deaths, and so on. So for each field, uh, we have a value, and these values uh, are expressed, are separated by commas for each line. So each line contains a set of values that are separated by commas. But this is the content of our data sets. So it provides number, uh, for example, number of cases, number of deaths, number of people in ICU, and so on. So I'm going to go back to uh, the, the data set. So now this instruction, basically import the CSV file inside our local uh, file. So we just run it. Okay, so again, this don't, don't produce any tangible output. So we won't be able to see an output uh, for them at the moment. So the other thing we want to do here is to uh, do a bit of configuration for the Jupyter Notebook. So uh, uh, we use what's called magic commands. What are magic commands? So magic commands are not really Python commands. So if you put this command, this is a magic command. If you put this command in Python, you won't be able to uh, run it. However, Jupyter uh, recognize these commands because these commands are preceded with the percent, this, no, this uh, symbol that, that tells uh, uh, Jupyter that these are magic commands that you want to execute. Magic command can be used for different purposes. If you click on the link provided here, you can read more, more about what these commands can do. 
uh, example, you can, for example, you can create alias that you can use in your Jupyter notebook. But for this uh, um, master class, the, uh, the, the magic command will tell that we want to visualize the output of our command in line after we execute the command. So at a certain point in our notebook, we will be able to visualize plots of our data. And this command basically tell us that we want to visualize this plot inside our uh, workbook. So after we execute the, piece, the command that we are running, for example, we run this command. And again, this command doesn't produce any tangible output, but wait because we will start seeing results very soon. Okay, again, uh, please interrupt me if you have questions or ask questions in the chat and Vivek and uh, Susan will be able to handle the question. So the first thing, so now that we loaded the, the data set, we want to read the CSV file and place it inside a variable. So the first thing we do here to read a CSV file uh, is to use uh, the Panda libraries. So uh, we use the PD uh, notation here because as you can recall earlier on, we say that pan we refer to pandas as PD. So every time we invoke a method that is provided by the Panda libraries, we will um, use the, the variable name PD. Dot read CSV. So read CSV is a command that allows us to basically read a CSV file and place it inside a variable that represent this file inside our code. And then what we do, the, 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 the second thing we do uh, is to invoke uh, the command uh, shape that allow us to basically read um, the different fields of our uh, data, the, the file that are in our data set. So if I, if I click on run uh, again, uh, basically this uh, will, will basically uh, tell us how many records uh, in this uh, uh, data set are available and how many fields, how many columns, how many fields we can visualize uh, in this uh, data set. So shape basically identify how many rows, how many entries we have in our CSV file and how many columns, uh, uh, how many fields we have for each uh, uh, information. So basically uh, in this case, so we stored our data set inside this variable called o OWID, o -W -I -D, uh, that, uh, and we can refer to this variable to perform different operation. One operation is shape, but we will now see other operation. For example, the operation, we will see now the operation head, tail, and sample n. So the operation head basically retrieves the first few rows, specific, um, uh, in, in, by default it retrieves the first five rows in our data set. So for example, if we click on OWID.head and we run this command, basically we will see the first five rows in our data set. The number of rows uh, starts from zero, one, two, three. So, uh, we will see that uh, the way in which we identify each row is through a number that uh, is assigned to the row in their order. So the first row will have number zero, the second row will have number one, the, the third row will have number two, and so on. Okay, so uh, the, the head returns the first uh, top five rows of the data frame. So if we, instead of head here, we uh, uh, run the command tail, for example, and we, um, and we run it, we will see instead the last five rows of our data set. And we can see here that the numbers <laughs> are very uh, high because we have over 159,000 records. As you, we can see here, we have 159,325 records of data. Okay, so instead, if we type here the command sample n, we will retrieve a random sample of, for example, 10 rows. 
So here the, the input parameter is a number that uh, tell, tell uh, how many random rows we want to extract from our data set, okay? So if I do this and I run, we will see that we will extract 10 random rows from our data set. Okay, so uh, as you can see, if, even if you see code here in your notebook, you should still be able to uh, click on the, on the box that contains the code and change the code depending on the functionality that you want to try. So the code that you see in this box uh, is not static. So you can edit it and see a results. And the Python uh, uh, system at the back end will run it on your behalf. Okay, so I, I, again, I'm, I'm gonna repeat it many, many times. Uh, if, you have, uh, if you have questions, please feel free uh, to, to ask at any time. So another important comment. Now we will have a look at all commands that are important to retrieve specific type of data from our data set. Okay, so one other interesting command is the, uh, the command index so so the index is exactly if you can see here this is the, this this field that contains a number is the index according to which we identify each row so if we click here and we we type o with index and we run it we can see that our index to identify each row starts from zero and stop uh, at uh, 159, 325. And they, they are increased by one. Each row is identified by a, a, an integer starting from zero and then increasing of one by one. So for it, what do I mean? So if I do here, uh, I repeat uh, O with head, which retrieve the first five, um, record, we will see each record is um, identified by an index that is incremented by one, starting from zero and ending, we can see the whole data set, but the index stops at 159,325. And that increase uh, of one, by one step to identify each row. Okay. So however, this doesn't have to be uh, the, the index. So we can eventually change the index uh, uh, that we use, but we will uh, have a look at it uh, later. Okay, another thing we want to uh, look is the columns. So as, as we can see here, each, uh, each field, you know, AFG, Asia, Afghanistan, and so on, is characterized by a column. The column, uh, I'll say, identify um, the, uh, the, the, the field and the type of the field uh, of each record. So if we type uh, um, O with the columns, basically what will happen here? So the O with the columns will list the name of all the columns in our, uh, in our uh, uh, data set. So ISO code, continent, location. So basically it will list the names of all the columns that, that represent uh, uh, the, the different fields that are assigned for each row. So we will see all this type of data that uh, are provided in each column. I don't know there are questions. I don't know who is looking at the question. I can see the chat uh, increasing. Uh, it's fine, I think, Juliana. Ah, okay, okay. Just, uh, it, it will be good if you just uh, speak over if there is anything I need to, any times I need to stop. Uh, because I won't be able to read the chat messages. So yeah, just okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Okay, so so that's uh, that's what we will see here. So we will see the name of the columns where uh, each field in each row uh, is provided. So uh, what we can do here, we can uh, say, we can identify all the um, values that are assigned to the location column, so, sorry, to the column location. So if we can see, uh, here we have a column location. So we can just retrieve the values that are present in the column location. How do we do that? 
we can do it with this command or with the uh, uh, square parenthesis, the name of the column we want to visualize. So if we run this command here, what we will see, okay, we won't be able to see all the values in this small uh, notebook, but at least uh, we will be able to see the initial, the first five and the last five. So these are the values that are assigned uh, to the location column, uh, to, sorry, to the column location. And that the other things uh, is that uh, we can do uh, is to understand what is the type of the value that are assigned uh, to this column. Uh, identifying the type is important because it will allow us to also understand what are the operations that we can do on this uh, data. Okay, so, so basically if we, uh, uh, if we uh, uh, type the common type, um, we provide the name of the data set and between square parentheses, uh, we provide the, the, the name of the column uh, for which we want to visualize the type and we run this command, what will happen is that this will tell us um, that this, the type of data is, uh, is series. So a panda series uh, is a set of values um, that have uh, a, a, a common index. And we can see that, uh, uh, so if you click on this button, we will see that- uh, uh, <laughs> Okay, so so if we if we example, if we click on this button, uh, we can see uh, the the type of data and uh, and also the parameters that this data can receive and additional operation uh, we can perform on this data. But basically, this is tell us that. Uh, uh, is, a, is a series of data that have a common type. Okay, so let's go back uh, to the notebook. So as you can see in this notebook, when you want to see more information about uh, mm -hmm. uh, the content, you can click on the link and you can learn more about uh, that, uh, that, that specific uh, uh, topic. In this case, the Panda series. So the, another thing we can do, we, we may not just visualize the content of one column, but we can also visualize the content of two columns, like what we did here. We, we are uh, uh, having the name of the data set, and we have two square parentheses in this case, and we identify the names of the two columns that we want to visualize. So if we run these commands, we will see that in this case, we will see two columns, the content of two columns, the content of location and the, con the content of continent. However, because now we are visualizing uh, the content of two columns, the type of data we refer, the, the, uh, that we return as a result uh, will be different, will not be a series like uh, it happened in, in the previous command, but will be different. And the type of data that will be generated as a result of this command will be data frame. Actually, uh, any, any table, any uh, in the end CSV file is a data frame uh, because it contains more than one column. So if our results, so if we select uh, at least two columns and the results of our operation contains more than one column, the type of data we refer to is a data frame. But instead, if, we, if the results of our operation only contains one column, we, we don't consider the index, okay? Only, con only contains one, the content of one column. In that case, uh, this is called series. And we will see that the series uh, and data frame uh, can perform different types of operations. So we can perform different type of operation on data frame and the series. So, um, so the other, so, so, However, we can also generate a data frame even if we have the content of a, for a single column. For example, we can do that by simply adding. So if you compare this, this, uh, this command or with location with this command, here we only have uh, a set of uh, open and close square parentheses. 
While in the second, in the second command, we have two open and two closed square parentheses. And these allow us to generate a data frame uh, when we select uh, the data coming uh, from the location column. So if we run this command, we will see that uh, this will be the result. So uh, this data will be considered as a data frame. These results will be considered as a data frame instead of a series. So this will allow us to perform a different set of operation on the object that is returned from this command. So again, if we type, if we use the command type to understand what is the type of data that is returned by this operation. And uh, uh, in this case, what we will, we will, what we will obtain is a, a data frame type. So basically this is a data frame type that contains a single column. Uh, so this, this difference is important because as I was saying, um, the operation that you can perform on the type of data that is a data of type data frame are different than uh, uh, the operation that you can perform if your data is of type uh, series. Okay, so I just was wondering, um, I'm, I'm gonna have a little break and to see if every everyone is, uh, is fine. I, I can see message on the chat. Um, yeah, so uh, actually there is a question there. Uh, if you have an Excel file, a different function can be used. Actually, that's a very valid, see Dart, that's a very valid question. So of course the commands, I am just going to go back to the part where we, um, when, when we read the, the CSV file. Because we are dealing with CSV file, the functionality of Panda that we use was read CSV. However, uh, if the file that you are reading, if the data set that you are handling with is an Excel file, for example, um, in that case, uh, uh, the command that you need to use is, for example, read Excel. Uh, so the, the type of command that you use depends on the type of file. Uh, uh, of your data set. That's basically, um, that's basically it. So I can see there is, uh, I, I don't know what the, the question is, CSV MS doc. I don't, I, I don't know if that is a question. So just, I think what Swapnil is asking is what kind of data formats can pandas read? And um, I've copy pasted a link which tells you uh, yeah. what Thank are you. all the formats that it can read. So MS doc is not a, typically not a, doc, a format that uses, has data. So it has mostly text. So the data files that it tends to read are, uh, Statistics files such as Stata, SAS, SPSS. Um, it can read XML, it can read CSV, um, it can read SQL files. So I, I, I don't think, as far as I know, Pandas doesn't read um, doc files specifically. Um, that is Microsoft Word, is, if that's what you mean. Um, so the link tells you all of the ones that Pandas is able to read natively, you can always import another library which is able to read a file format that you have. So ultimately, it's about whether you have the library function available to read the data that you have. Yeah, and if I can add as well, generally when you do data analytics, uh, your data set is not expressed in a Word file. So your data set will be mainly uh, represented uh, using a CSV file. And, and so that's why um, we, we thought that, you know, using CSV file and having an example with CSV file is probably more appropriate because that's probably the format of data set that you, you will encounter in your 
uh, daily data analytics uh, tasks. Okay, so, so I'm just going, going to continue. And you can also uh, save a, a local uh, copy. So if you, uh, if you remember, uh, we created the three um, uh, variables. And one, one variable was containing the link uh, to the uh, CSV file in the uh, GitHub repository. But another link was referring to the, the location in your file system. Uh, so, sorry, in, in this case, in your uh, local file in your Jupyter console, uh, where the OWID data set uh, um, is stored. And so in this case, uh, we can uh, store the OWID data set at this location. So, and, and to refer to this location, we use the variable local OWID data set. And if you can see, in 14 is that uh, we uh, save our, the content of our OWID file, which is inside the variable OWID, inside the, this file in the, um, which location is specified inside the, the variable local OWID dataset. So the reason why uh, the index uh, equal false uh, is that it, this means uh, that uh, we don't need to store the names of the row or the index, uh, since uh, where they were assigned automatically by Pandas when the original file was read uh, from the data set. So uh, it's not necessary to store the index because Panda will re regenerate uh, the data set when uh, it reads the file. So sorry, the index when uh, it read, uh, Panda reads the file. And again, we invoke the command O with shape. We saw this command before, and this command returns uh, the number of rows and the number of columns uh, of our file. So, uh, okay. So now we, we are going to um, uh, move to another topic. Um, and the topic uh, is uh, the selection and the indexing of the file. So, uh, you know, it took some time to generate an output, but you know, eventually it does generate an output. So, um, so the the select so that means that we want to extract a specifically a specific piece of information we are interested in from this data set, and we are also we also want to be able to change the index that is used to identify each row. So, as again. So we have seen this already. So with the command head, we are able to extract the first five rows of uh, our uh, data set. So basically in this case, the first five row. As we can see, the index is this number that is automatically generated by Panda. However, uh, we can change the index. We can say, okay, we want to set the index to the uh, column location. So we want to use the column location to index uh, our um, rows, okay? So if we type the command O with equal uh, O with dot set index location, and then we type O with, and we run this command, we will visualize uh, the content of the table in this way. So basically we won't see anymore the index, uh, or the numerical index of the column, but now the index of the column will be the location. Of course, because uh, the location is the same for many of the rows, this won't really um, allow us to uh, identify the, call, the rows uh, uniquely. But this is just to show you how we can in, in, um, uh, put uh, the, the column uh, in an order, in this case, in order of, uh, sorry, our rows in an order, in this case, in order of countries. So as you can see, we here in, in 20, we have two commands. So the first command allow us to modify our data set by changing the index that is used to index our rows. Uh, and the second command is a command that uh, uh, basically prints the content of our data set by simply naming the variables that contains the data set. In this case, OWID. 
uh, okay, again, we won't be able to see the whole data set in the notebook, but we will see the first five. If you run this on, in Python, you should be able to do that um, to visualize the whole data set. So uh, we will only be able to see the first five rows and the last five rows. Okay, so the integer index is no longer present. Now the rows are indexed with the, knee, the column location. So uh, then what we can do, we can extract a, a specific content we are interested in. For example, we can say, we only want to extract the rows that, uh, of, of which uh, location uh, is, uh, that the, of which location is Ireland. Okay. So to do that, uh, we used the, the lock command. So uh, in this case, uh, um, the lock command refers to the value that is applied to an index. So we wouldn't be able, for example, to use the lock command uh, if the value, uh, in this way, if the value of the index was still an integer. So the value lock saying, please select only those rows was value of the index is Ireland, okay? Uh, so if we run this command, basically, we will only visualize here the uh, rows of which location, uh, because the, of which index value is equal to Ireland. So this allow us to extract only rows that have a specific value for the index. Also, what we can do is saying, okay, I don't want to just extract the rows for, uh, the rows for which the value of the index is Ireland, but to also want to extract the rows for which the value of the index is uh, United Kingdom. And we can do that by putting uh, two square parentheses. And uh, uh, in, in our uh, request. So if we run this uh, command, we will notice that we will see this result. So we will extract all the rows of which index as value Ireland and the United Kingdom. And also another thing we can do is to provide an index range. So the idea is that uh, the use of index allow us to order uh, the, the rows of our table uh, the, according to a specific uh, attribute. So in this case, what we can do, we can uh, simply say that uh, uh, we want to um, uh, select all the, cont all the rows that have a, a, an index comprised from Ireland to United Kingdom. So, So we will see, we won't be able to see the values in the middle, but in this case, uh, this uh, command extract all the rows that have value alphabetically of the index alphabetically comprised between Ireland and United Kingdom. So, so a, a, as you can see here, it's hard to see what you have selected because uh, Jupyter only allows you to show a part of the data frame. But, uh, you know, uh, to, to understand if you are really extracting all the rows that have uh, an index comprised between Ireland and United Kingdom, we can simply say how many um, index, unique index value are we extracting? Okay, if we were extracting only value uh, of rows uh, that have index Ireland and United Kingdom, the results of these uh, query will be two. So for example, uh, if, we, uh, if we do something like this, we expect the result to be uh, two, because we only extract Ireland and United Kingdom. However, if we do this, Oops. Um, okay. Oh, sorry. However, if you do this, uh, actually the result 
will be a, a list of all the index, so with all the location of the rows that uh, have index comprised between Ireland and the United Kingdom. So we have uh, um, several uh, rows, actually 124 rows that are extracted. So uh, if you, in, instead of unique, we type the command n unique, we will only uh, visualize the number of the unique uh, indexes that are comprised between Ireland and United Kingdom. Okay, so I'm going to, uh, uh, so the difference between unique and then unique is that the command unique list the unique uh, indexes, in this case the location, that are comprised between Ireland and the United Kingdom, while the, co the command and unique simply listed how many uh, uh, index, unique indexes are comprised alphabetically between Ireland and the United Kingdom. So I'm going to pause here uh, and I'm going to uh, leave uh, the, 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 the uh, leave it to Vivek to continue. Uh, the, 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 the tutorial. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Lilia. Let me okay, try and come. try and see. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, see. Can everyone see that? Yep. Yeah. So there was a question in the chat which said that, um, does this mean there are 124 countries uh, unique between Ireland and uh, the United Kingdom? And the answer is, um, yes, there are 124 unique names, but as we shall see uh, when we go into the data set, not everything in the location column is an actual country. There are other data things, data items that are mixed in. So, this is actually a common thing that you will find in data sets. When you get an actual real data set, you will find that there's a lot of noise in the data. So data that doesn't belong in the correct place, data that the fields are correct, but the correct data isn't there. So all of that is a fundamental part of learning to do data science. First thing that you have to do is to understand what does the data set look like uh, and doing what is called cleaning the data set. And that is what we are doing right now. So um, I just wanted to show you uh, something else since um, 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 Liliana talked about um, indices and ranges. Um, you can do something like you can do something that's nonsensical as well. And by nonsensical, I mean, it may mean make sense to you um, as a human being, but for, a, um, for pandas, it doesn't make sense. And this is uh, part of the problem of being, well, a computer. It, it sort of works in a very logical manner. So supposing I said, um, instead of United Kingdom, I said, well, let me look at India, for example. Right? And you expect to see a similar thing between, well, a fewer number of countries, of course, because both Ireland and India are with an eye. But let's see what happens. Um, what happened here? Mm -hmm. Ah, there's an extra. Right. OK. And now it says nothing. Now, why is that? Now, the thing is that when Python, when you give a range to Python like this, it expects that the first one is the starting range and the second one is the ending range. Okay. Now, if you think about countries listed alphabetically, you would realize that Ireland comes after India. So what you're telling is, telling Python or Pandas is that in the OVID dataset, 
go find Ireland, and then keep going until you find India. Right? How many data sets, how many rows exist between Ireland and India? Okay. But only in one direction. And obviously, because India comes before Ireland, there are zero data sets with, if you start with Ireland and end with India. Okay. So if you reverse that, this one should give us the data that we're looking for. Okay. So I hope that kind of makes sense that you have to know your data. Okay. What, what makes common sense to you need not make common sense to pandas. Okay. It tries its best, but you still have to use your own understanding of the data and the relationships of how the data is structured. <clears throat> now, now that you know what a start and a stop is for a range, we can also start to do things like slices. What that means is you can tell Python, I don't want all of the data between Ireland and the United Kingdom. I can use things like a step notation. If you double click on that link, you will see the actual link where it points to. And that link will tell you what slice actually does. In our case, what it does is the step notation tells you how many things should it skip. By default, step is one, which means for every iteration in the loop, it will get the record. However, if you say colon two, it will skip one and go to the second one. So basically it says, get me every second row between Ireland and the UK. So if you run this one, you'll find that the number of rows are different. Okay. So in this case, all we've done is we filtered it such that there are 40,000 rows. What if we do every third row? Okay. We see that there's 26,000 rows. So the number of rows that are returned by this slice, so this operation is called slicing the data. We are trying to slice through the data frame such that we get back data that's of interest. If you didn't do this at all, and you kept it at one, if it's one, you don't have to write it. Pandas assumes that it is one. We'll see that the total number of rows is actually 80,000. Right? Now, when we started off, we started off with indexing the columns. Okay. Now, the thing is that it's not necessary that you have to get rows sliced. Columns can also be sliced. So which means that you can use the dot lock to index by columns and rows. So to go back to our original example, we've got the rows sliced between Ireland and the United Kingdom. And you could also say, give me the columns between the column continent and the column new cases. So now that will return all the rows for every second column between continent and new cases. Okay. So it returns all the rows, but only every second column. So this slicing is dependent on where you apply the slice. Okay. You could have applied it here. Okay. In which case, now we expect 
about half the rows again. So we should get approximately 40,000 rows. And that is what we get. So the slicing can be applied to the rows as well as to the columns. <clears throat> now, all of this assumes that we know our data intimately. We look inside the data, if it's a CSV file, if it's an Excel file, if it's, a, if it's some other kind of a table of a spreadsheet, and we know what data we want. But sometimes you also want to do what is called positional indexing. Positional indexing, as opposed to what we've been doing so far, which is called label indexing. Okay. Positional indexing works by the position of the data item in the data set. Okay, so, and that is done using the command dot I lock. Okay, this is I standing for integer location. Okay, so instead of giving a label such as Ireland. Okay. Now we give a number, an integer. Okay. So an example, if I say on the Ovid data set, give me the data item at location zero. Okay. So you have I lock of zero. And now it gives you every column along with the value of that column. Okay. Again, instead of having to specify every number that we're interested in, we can always do another slice using the range format that we've seen before, which is start, colon, stop. Right? So if we say ovid, dot I lock zero to 10. Okay. And if we execute that, we get the first 10 rows as a data frame. Okay. So now in this case, <clears throat> the, um, the thing that Python has, this is not nothing to do with pandas, this is a Python issue that Python and most computer programming languages start numbering or counting from zero. So the first item in the data set is the zeroth item. So even though we said zero to 10, so row number zero, row number one, row number two, row number three, the total number of rows you have is four, but the row number is three. Okay, so when you go from zero to 10, you would have got row number nine. Okay. Well, this is just um, an idiosyncrasy of programming languages that, well, you just have to get used to, I'm, I'm afraid. Um, well, once you've got that out of the way, you can actually start with having slices, having the same thing as start from zero, end at 10 and have a step size again of two. So now you will get 10 rows, but instead of that, you will get every second row. Okay. And then for columns, you can do a similar thing. Instead of saying, I want column this, column that, column that, I can say, Previously, we said continent and um, total cases, but instead of that, we can just say, I want column number zero to 20, but I don't want all of the columns. I want every third column. So the slicing concept works in all cases. When we do label-based indexing, as well as when we do integer based or positional indexing. So once you get the slicing concept, you can apply it any which way you want, which can be quite flexible when you're trying to just explore the data 
that you have. Okay. So um, I'm going to pause there for just a minute to see if there are any questions. No? Okay. Now we're going to come to an important pattern of selecting data that is often used in data frames. And this is called masking. Think of a mask exactly as a metaphor for an actual mask. Okay. A mask hides some bits of, bits, uh, pieces of uh, information and lets out other pieces of information. In this case, it's like a sieve. It, if you think of it as a Boolean sieve, that is true or false, all the items that return true for that mask will be returned and all the items that return false are not returned. So the mask reveals data that is true for that condition, for that mask, and hides all of the data that is false for that condition. So let's try and define a condition or a mask. So we defined a mask saying more than 100 cases. Well, in this case, this is just a variable name. We've just given it a good name so that we remember what it, what it was for. I could have just given a name M100C and it would still work. It's just that I won't remember after a while what that was for. So I define that and say the condition is for in the data set OVID, if the total cases are greater than 100. Now you can see this is immediately a relational condition. The total cases will either be greater than 100 or not. So for every row where the total cases is greater than 100 will return true. And every row where the total cases is less than 100, it will return false. Okay. So now if you create a mask like this, and in this case, we just print what the mask does for every row, it shows you this is false, this is false, and then for certain cases, they are true. Okay. Now that is just the definition of the mask. If you want to return or select only the rows where the mask is true, we say on OVID, select the mask. Okay. And if we execute that cell, okay, now you get data where the total cases are greater than true. So we originally had about 800,000 rows. Now we have only 137,000 rows. Yeah. So the condition is that they meet that the total cases is always greater than 100. Okay. Now, of course, um, you can combine a mask and the positional based selection, right? You can combine a mask with label based selection. Okay. So, can you think of a way of saying how many records exist where Ireland has more than 100 cases? Okay. I leave that as a little exercise for the students. I love being this, this part of the teacher. When I was a student, I had this thing where uh, it says, this left as an exercise for the student. And now when I'm a teacher, I actually quite like that. It helps me to understand if you're following along. So that's your exercise. Do we have any immediate questions? We have only 10 minutes left, so I'm not going to pause too long. Uh, but hopefully I am being clear. If there's any questions, please do write them out in the chat. No? Okay. 
Silence means no questions. <clears throat> so let's move on to uh, doing other things with the data set. Well, the first thing that we'll do is, um, you remember that we had set the index to location, right? Which is how it allowed us to say, Ovid, Ireland, Ovid, Ireland to the UK, and so on and so forth. Uh, now let's reset that because uh, some Python commands or pandas commands will assume that the index is the index number that it gave automatically. And the way to do that is to use the command called reset index. Okay. Just to see the difference, let's first print Ovid head. Okay. And you can see that location is here and ISO code is here. You can see that it is slightly subtly different. The index is on the leftmost, okay? and it's not at the same level as the columns. Okay? Once you do reset index, okay, and then print out the head again, you can see that the index is back to being 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. And location has gone back to being a normal column. Okay. <clears throat> so this has the advantage that you can explore your data set, set different indices, and then always come back to the original data set or the original where the index was by just saying reset index. You haven't done any harm. So you sh this should give you confidence that you can play around with the data set and not have to um, restart with starting to read the data set again. <clears throat> okay. Now, um, one of the things that Liliana um, showed up earlier was this notion of um, a sample. Okay, A sample is exactly what it sounds like. It is a random sample from the data set. Now, if you give it some number, it will pick out that many random samples from the data set. Okay. In this case, it just picked up Cayman Islands, Niger, and Haiti. Okay. If we run it again, I hope to see different numbers. So there you go. So if you just want to pluck out numbers or records from the data set, sample is a good way to figure out what's inside your data. Okay. Another thing that we want to look at is this data set. Uh, typically, if you've done arrays in other programming languages, arrays are homogeneous, okay. which means that if you have an array of numbers, it's all numbers. If it's strings, it's all strings whereas data frames are slightly special in that, apart from the fact that they can be indexed, every data in the cell could have a different data type. Okay. And when, when, you, when we loaded the data into Pandas using read CSV, um, Pandas, you didn't tell it what data type it was, Pandas just looked at the data and guessed. Okay. And sometimes it will guess wrong. Okay. So um, <clears throat> to figure out how what are all of the column types that Pandas has guessed, okay, check out there's a property called D types, which is short for data types. Okay. So let's see what the first one is for the first, let's say for the five ones, the first five that it had. Okay. In this case, total cases is a floating point number. Date is an object. Continent is an object. Location is an object. Okay. Now, in this case, what this tells us is that if you take a look at the date column, Okay. <clears throat> if you take a look inside the date column, these are actually just strings. Okay. So 
which is not what you want when you want to say it doesn't actually understand that in this case, 31st of January comes before 1st of February. It's just got them in as objects, which are just strings. Okay. Now, there's advantages to this and there's disadvantages to this. Okay. So we can see, okay, what's the type of date if we pick only the first one? Okay. This, what type of an object it is, is it? It is just a string. Okay. Instead of just getting the type, we can say, what are the values? It says, okay, it is this column called date is an array which contains strings of this type. Okay. <clears throat> now, the interesting thing to note is that this was a column, okay? But if you see, pay attention to this square parenthesis here, okay? This is the typical notation used for an array. What, ha what is happening is that internally, pandas is representing values as an array from NumPy. NumPy is a library in Python, which is used for a lot of numerical calculations. It is built for efficient calculation using numbers. And Pandas uses it as a basic component for representing a series or a bunch of stuff. Okay, so now to come back to the date problem, we looked at date and we represented it as a string. And you might say, well, that's okay. Okay, so supposing you wanted to find all of the records that happened on Christmas day, you just say, okay, I create a mask. Okay, and I say the mask is the Ovid date column is equal to equal equal in programming languages, most programming languages refers to equal in the mathematical sense of equality to 2020 Christmas day, okay? And now if you execute this cell, you will get all of the records where it's false and some records where it's true, okay? So now if you put this mask on the data set, and execute it, you will get only the records where it's true. So there were 223 data items where the mask was true. So you see, this is how a mask creates a slice of the data set that you're looking at. Okay. <clears throat> so now, um, if we create a mask like this, we can say, okay, what's, we can examine it again to see whether it's returned false or not. <clears throat> okay. So now um, <clears throat> there's some to do's here. Okay, now in the to-dos, those are sort of, again, things for the student to do, to do at home, to figure out, have you understood what we are talking about? But let's go ahead just a little bit because I want to complete this thing about dates. When you have strings, a string is not quite a date. It represents a date, but I want to say one day after Christmas days or seven days, which is one week after a particular day, which is New Year's Day, and so on and so forth, then you want to tell Python that this particular object is not just a string. It is a date, okay? So what we need to do is, instead of treating a date as a string, we can tell Python, treat 
these this particular column as what is called a date time object. Okay. What that means is that there is a special object inside Python, which is which represents dates and times. So you can say, give me all the data for something three days after this event. So Python understands days being three different dates. Whereas if it were just a string, Python wouldn't understand anything. Okay. So the way to do that is that when you read in the data set, you pass in an extra keyword that says parse dates. This tells Python or pandas in this case that a particular column called date is actually just dates. Okay, so now inside Ovid, the data types that it would get would have a date. Let's examine that. We run that cell. <clears throat> As an aside, so when I run the cell, you see a star coming out here. Okay, that star is effectively Jupyter running your command on the data set. If it's a command that takes a long time, you can see the star. If it's a command that executes fast, you don't even see the star. So have, if there is a star there, don't panic. It's just that Jupyter is working on your data. Anyway, so once we read the CSV using the parse dates command, using the parse dates as an additional keyword, now when we look at the data types inside COVID, the first five only, we find that date is now a date time object. Okay. Previously, it was an object, but now it's converted to date time. Okay, so I think we've run out of time. Um, hopefully all of this has been clear uh, to you. Um, are there any questions that I can quickly deal with? <clears throat> Please do go through the rest of the notebook and hopefully the rest of the notebook is self-explanatory. One of the reasons that we use a Jupyter notebook and not just any programming language is that it allows us to have text and code intermixed. So when a data analyst typically does analysis, they type in what they're thinking and you can see them progress step by step through the data. And you can identify whether a particular cell is data or code by this particular cell here. As you can see, this one currently says code, whereas this one says markdown. Markdown is a format which allows you to write text and have it formatted slightly better than plain text. So in this case, for example, this is an also a markdown cell. If you double click on it, you'll see how the markdown was generated. A single hash makes it a really big heading. If I had double clicked on it and put hash hash, it becomes a smaller one. Now, the point of all this is so that when you write code, sometimes you want to provide the explanation of what you're thinking so that somebody else, when they look at your code, can understand the logical flow with which you approached the data, okay? And of course, code is just Python code, okay? <clears throat> right, so I think we're out of time at this point. Uh, and I'll have to stop now. Um, I hope this has been interesting for you. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please do let me know. Uh, if you have any questions right now that you can think of, 
um, either raise your hand or type them in the chat and we should be able to answer them quickly. Uh, if not, I think uh, we are at the end of the session. Please do, of course, go through the Jupyter notebooks and please do, uh, don't hesitate to send questions by email if you have them. Hi, yes, I see Adam's hand raised. So Adam, if you want to ask, yeah. Yeah, it was more of just an offer uh, if people wanted it. I know this might be a lot of information for some people. And since we didn't get through go, to go through all the notebook, um, I'm a lab tutor in the School of Computing in DCU. So if anyone wanted to do an informal tutorial type session next week after they've had a chance to go through the notebook, I'd be happy. I'd be happy to do it. Um, you can just let me know on um, on Discord. Thank you, Adam. That was. I'm sure many people will take you up on that. <laughs> and, and Adam, may I suggest you put it on Discord as well, so that the ones who are not here can also benefit from that. Yeah, I'll I'll send in a message in the in general channel. And thanks um, for putting on on the session and putting together the, the tutorials. They were really thorough. Thanks. Hope they're clear. <laughs> Very, very clear, just a lot of information, I think. <laughs> Vivek, uh, I don't know, are you on Discord or is that your email on Discord? Can we share it with them? Sure. Uh, my, I'm not on Discord, but my email should be, it's uh, vivek.nalur. Yeah, uh, I have it because I sent oh, you the calendar yeah. invite, so I will put it on Discord then. Yeah, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's a question that says, how can you export the section output? Um, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure exactly what you're referring to. Um, do you mean what's shown in every cell or do you mean the data frame? Um, hi, Vivek, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, my question was that, so we are extracting all the outputs. So these small outputs, how can we export and use it? Or, I mean, in terms of maybe making a graph or something like that? Uh, so we haven't reached the point where we make a graph. I mean, but if you go through the notebooks that have been sent to you, uh, we, I think in the second or the third, in the second one, I think you start to make graphs. But um, in a nutshell, the we covered this when, um, Liliana covered two CSV. So remember, all of these are just variables, right? So ovid.iloc is a function that is returning some data, okay? If you put it inside another data frame, um, there is a, um, a function called two CSV, okay? Two CSV right here, this is the function, right? saving a local copy. So in this case, local OVID dataset was a variable that specified the path where the file should be saved. And when you call to CSV on it, whatever's inside OVID will be saved to a file that is specified by this variable, right? So then you have it as a file and then you can reload it later and look at it. So you're exporting that. Now, if you wanted just a smaller section of it, Instead of saving Ovid, you say, let's say, in this case, if I say um, my frame is equal to Ovid head. Okay. So now my frame is a new data frame that has been created. And now I can say my frame dot to CSV. Okay. That would export it to a file again. Okay, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, it was a really good session. Sure. I guess you're out of questions. <laughs>
Yeah, I guess there are no more questions. Okay. So if you think of other questions later on, feel free to um, send me an email. Um, uh, yeah, I'll be happy to answer them. And of course, Adam has generously offered his time, so uh, feel free to play him with your questions as well. <laughs> Thank you, Adam, for that. No so, problem. Get up. Yeah. <laughs> Can. <laughs> Great. So I think we've come to the end of the session, but I want to thank Vivek and Liliana, Susan, for uh, such a wonderful session. Um, I know it's a lot of information, but I think uh, it's very valuable to have this uh, masterclass and we've recorded it. And we also have the Jupyter notes on the Discord. So, you know, we'll encourage everyone to go through it and take up Adam on his offer. Adam, get in touch with the team and they can help you set up a Zoom link or whatever if you need, if you need any help. Um, well, thank you everyone and see you next Friday and keep uh, in touch on Discord. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye.